Why do you think the umpire has given the free hit for the batsman? Yes, the bowler has crossed the crease completely, which is considered as no ball. You all know the rules of cricket. Similarly, in football, the player should not touch the ball with his hand. In every game, we have some rules and these rules help define the game and helps us distinguish one game from another. Do we have such rules in our society? Yes, like these games, a society also has constitutive rules that make it what it is and differentiate it from other kinds of societies. In large societies, in which different communities of people live together, these rules are formulated through consensus and in modern countries, this consensus is usually available in written form. A written document in which we find such rules is called a constitution. Why do you think we need a constitution? The constitution serves several purposes. Let us look at them one by one. Constitution lays out certain ideals that form the basis of the kind of country that we as citizens aspire to live in. A constitution helps serve as a set of rules and principles that the entire population in a country can agree upon. Let us understand it with an example of our neighboring country, Nepal. The country of Nepal has witnessed several people's struggles for democracy. There was a people's struggle in 1990 that established democracy. But the constitution rested the final authority with the king. After a people's movement for a long time in 2006, they finally succeeded in putting an end to the powers of the king. They had to write a new constitution to establish Nepal as a democracy. Why do you think people did not want to obey 1990 constitution? The Nepal population did not want to continue with the previous constitution because it did not reflect the ideals of the country that the people wanted it to be. While moving from a monarchy to a democratic government, constitution plays a crucial role in laying out certain important guidelines that govern decision making. Thus, the second important purpose of a constitution is to define the nature of a country's political system. In a democracy, we choose our leaders so that they can exercise power responsibly on our behalf. But do you think that the leaders do not misuse their authority? Let us look at this classroom to get the answer. Rohan, the class monitor, does not have a good relation with his classmate Arun. Rohan always puts false complaints of making noise against Arun to the teachers. As the responsibility of minding the class is vested upon the class monitor Rohan, Arun is often punished by teachers for no reason. Similarly, there is always the possibility that the leaders in a political system might misuse their authority. How do you think this can be prevented? In democratic societies, the constitution often lays down rules that guard against this misuse of power by our political leaders. In the case of the Indian constitution, many of these laws are contained in the section on fundamental rights. Recall right to equality that says no citizen can be discriminated against on grounds of religion, race, caste, gender and place of birth. Look at another situation. The class teacher of class 8A takes the students to the playground, but some students started arguing with each other for playing cricket instead of football. The class teacher decides to settle the problem with a show of hands. The decision goes for cricket as there are more kids in the class who play cricket. The boys and girls who opt for football are disappointed. They are always deprived from practicing as they are less in number in the class. Who is minority in the example? What would you have done if you were the class teacher? The students playing football are in the minority group. The teacher could have solved the problem 
by dividing the time for both cricket and football. Such unhealthy situations can occur in democratic societies too, where a majority can continuously enforce decisions that exclude minorities and go against their interests. Every society is prone to this tyranny or domination of the majority. Hence, the constitution usually contains rules that ensure that minorities are not excluded from anything that is routinely available to the majority. The force Look at another the, uh, example. Today is Sunday. Everyone in Shoba's house and, uh, so is watching the, the cricket match except Shoba. She is studying for the test on Monday, but she is also tempted to watch the game. As she gets to hear some noise from the television, she comes out from her study room to know whether somebody is out or it is a six. Then, Shobha's parents make the decision to switch off the television. Why do you think Shobha's parents decide not to watch the match? Though all of them want to watch the match, Shobha's parents switch off the television so that their daughter does not get distracted from her studies. This is very usual in every family. Parents take decisions for the well-being of their children in wider context. Similarly, at a large scale, the constitution protects us against certain decisions which a few people can take, but they could have an adverse effect on the larger principles that the country believes in. Thus, we need a constitution to save us from ourselves. A good constitution does not allow the whims of few people to change its basic structure. It does not allow for the easy overthrow of provisions that guarantee rights of citizens and protect their freedom. For a moment, after decades of agitation against the British, finally our country attained independence in 1947. The country was born through a partition on the basis of religious differences. Partition of India and Pakistan was a traumatic experience for the people of both the countries. About 10 lakh people were killed on both sides of the border in partition-related violence. There was another problem regarding the merger of the princely states and British had left the decision on the rulers of these states. There were sharp differences of opinion within the freedom struggle about the path India should take after independence. Imagine yourself as the citizen of India during independence. How you would have wanted your country to be? Though you may have different opinions, but a country where everyone has equal rights would have been one of your prime expectations. The long experience of authoritarian colonial rule convinced Indians that the free country had to be a democracy where every person has equal rights and everyone is allowed to participate in the formation of the government. What do you think was the first task to set up a democratic form of governance in the country? People had to find out ways in which a democratic government would set up in India and the rules that would determine its functioning. Hence, a group of around 300 people became members of the Constituent Assembly in 1946 and met periodically for the next three years to write India's constitution. Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar was the chairman of the drafting committee of the constitution and is therefore also known as the father of the Indian constitution. Sardar Wallabhai Patel was also a prominent member of the Constituent Assembly. Each provision of the future constitution was discussed in great detail in the Constituent Assembly and there was a sincere effort to compromise and reach an agreement through consensus. What do you think were some of the challenges faced by the Constituent Assembly while writing the constitution? There were many princely states in India who were yet undecided about their future. Years of British colonial rule had led to widespread poverty and economic condition of the people and the country was dismal. Indian society is very diverse with people speaking various languages, following different religions and cultures. There was also a large part of the society like the scheduled tribes, castes and backward classes who were discriminated by the upper caste in the society. With all these challenges, the Constituent Committee had a tough task at hand, but they rose very well to the occasion and gave India a visionary document 
that reflects a respect for maintaining diversity while preserving national unity. Do you know that Indian constitution is the longest written constitution of any sovereign country in the world? The Indian constitution passed by the Constituent Assembly on 26 November 1949 came into effect on 26 January 1950. Now, let us look at the important features of our constitution. Recall the various levels of government in the country. Can you name the various levels of government in our country? In India, we have a three-tier government structure, central government, state government and Panchayati Raj or local government. The existence of more than one level of the government in the country is referred to as federalism. Federalism is the first key feature of Indian constitution. The constitution contains lists that describe the issues that each tier of government can make laws on. The constitution also specifies where each tier of government can get the money from for the work what it does. In a federal government, the states draw the authority from the constitution. Here, the word state does not refer to state government, but refers to a political institution that represents a sovereign people who occupy a definite territory. For example, the Indian state, the Nepali state, etc. The government is just one part of the state. Why do you think federal form of government was chosen in the constitution? This was done to handle a diverse and large community of people. Through this system, each person, irrespective of which part of the country he is in, plays a role in the government. It also helps protect regional disparities by giving certain powers at the state level. At the same time, national integrity and issues at the national level are handled by the central government. Look at this long queue of people. From this picture, can you tell why these people are waiting in the queue? Yes, they are standing in line to vote during an election. The Constitution of India opted for a parliamentary form of government, where different tiers of government consist of representatives elected by the people. Constitution of India guarantees universal adult suffrage for all citizens, which means every person above 18 years of age, irrespective of his gender, religion, caste, creed, place, has an equal right to vote. So, the people of India have a direct role in electing their representatives. Moreover, every citizen of the country, irrespective of the social background, can also contest in elections. What challenges faced by India were addressed by this feature of constitution? This right of voting gives power to every person in the country and has helped reduce discrimination and inequality from the Indian society. Separation of powers is another key feature of our constitution. Let us see how power is separated. You must be aware of the 2G spectrum case where telecom licenses were given way beyond the market price to several private companies by the government officials. The issue was raised by social activists in the Supreme Court which gave a judgment to cancel all 122 licenses awarded. The government was asked to formulate a fresh policy and ensure transparency and right price so that the country has no financial loss through sale of its resources. Thus, decision taken by legislature was overruled by judiciary to protect national interests. According to our constitution, there are three organs of the state, the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. The legislature refers to our elected representatives. The executive is a smaller group of people responsible for implementing laws and running the government. The judiciary refers to the system of courts in this country. Now, do you see any similarity between the class monitors misusing power in the previous lesson with the 2G scam mentioned here? How do you think the constitution prevents such misuse of power? The constitution says that each of the organs should exercise different powers. Each organ acts as a check on the other organs of the state and this ensures the balance of power between the three. Look at these instances. Ramu is not allowed to play in the public playground as he belongs to a Dalit community. A 12-year-old child is working in a brick-making factory. 
A group of people are not given permission to open a Kannada medium school in Tamil Nadu. Mr. Kapoor from Punjab is not allowed to construct his house in Kerala. A religious procession is not allowed to enter an area dominated by another religion. What do you think is wrong in the above examples? In these examples, rights of some individuals are violated. The constitution thus guarantees the fundamental rights of individuals against the state as well as against other individuals. In the first instance, right to equality is violated. Right to equality says that every person is equal before the law. This also means that every person shall be equally protected by the laws of the country. It also states that no citizen can be discriminated against on the basis of their religion, caste or sex. Every person has access to all public places, including playgrounds, hotels, shops, etc. The state cannot discriminate against anyone in matters of employment. Can you state the right violated in the second example? The constitution prohibits trafficking, forced labor and children working under 14 years of age through right against exploitation. In the third instance, there is violation of cultural and educational rights. The constitution states that all minorities, religious or linguistic, can set up their own educational institutions in order to preserve and develop their own culture. What right is violated in the case of Mr. Kapoor? Right to freedom that allows Indian citizens to move freely and reside in any part of the country is violated in case of Mr. Kapoor. Right to freedom also includes the right to freedom of speech and expression, the right to form associations, and the right to practice any profession, occupation, or business. In case of fifth example, right to freedom of religion is violated. Religious freedom is provided to all citizens. Every person has the right to practice, profess, and propagate the religion of their choice. Here, all of them in the given examples can move to the court. Our constitution allows citizens to move the court if they believe that any of the fundamental rights have been violated by the state. This is known as right to constitutional remedies. In addition to fundamental rights, the constitution also has a section called Directive Principles of State Policy. These ensure greater social and economic reform and serve as a guide to independent India. Does our country promote any religion? No. India is a secular state and does not officially promote any one religion as the state religion. Thus, secularism is another feature of the Indian constitution. Now, recall the cricket match in the previous lesson. Say, International Cricket Council decides to abolish the rule of free head in case of crossing the crease by the bowler. A change of constitutive rules will affect the game. Similarly, any major changes in the constitution mean a change in the fundamental nature of the country. However, Indian constitution has been changed over the years to reflect new concerns of the polity. The constitution plays a crucial role in laying out the ideals that we would like all citizens of the country to adhere to, including the representatives that we elect to rule us.